Lightning stuff is where I have the most fun. So here I am in a lightning company. You start to wonder like what have apps, Bitcoin apps been, you know, stripping out of their apps this whole time that they've never been able to implement? Like what could we have seen Bitcoin usage be if every app didn't have to go through Apple? Like you don't hear about all the apps that get banned. I believe me and Paul just looked up the messages, but it was like back in September and I just messaged them like, fuck it, dude, let's go to the web. They can't stop us there. I mean, I want to see more non-custodial usage because like Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship resistant and I think Lightning should be as well. And if we wanted to see that grow, um, we have to push for more non-custodial usage. Nostra Wall Connect and Nostra in general works really well in asynchronous context where you don't need to be online all the time in order to interact with a Lightning Wallet or application itself. There's like 70,000 plus channels on the Lightning Network today. You know how many paths exist to any given node? It's it's absolutely insane. It's uh, <laughs> If anything keeps me up at night, it's like pathfinding on Lightning. Tony Giorgio is the co-founder and CEO of Mutiny Wallet, a self-custodial Lightning Wallet that runs in your web browser. In our conversation, we got into why Tony first set out to build Mutiny Wallet we explored the benefits of building on the web. We talked about some of the unique features and integrations Mutiny is working on, such as Nostra Wallet Connect and Coin Joins. And then we got into the state of the Lightning Network ecosystem and reflected on Tony's recent blog post, Lightning Everywhere. If you enjoy this episode and if you learn something new, the best way you can show your support for this show is by sending in sats over the Lightning Network. You can use any podcasting 2.0 app there are dozens of them out there, but my favorite one to use is Fountain. Before we get into today's show, just a quick message from our sponsors. Today's show is sponsored by Voltage. Voltage is the premier provider of Bitcoin and Lightning node infrastructure. Today's show is also sponsored by Stackwork. And Stackwork is a Lightning powered transcription tool that takes the best of AIs and humans to create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. We'll have more from Voltage and Stackwork later in the show. Tony, welcome to the show. I am so excited to talk about Mutiny and all the work you're doing and your recent blog posts about lightning everywhere. Um, but before we get into all that, let's start with your background. Give listeners a better understanding of your life prior to Bitcoin and how you first got introduced to Bitcoin. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Um, it's good to be here. I think, yeah, it was around 2017 or so just getting involved in you know, I mean, you know, everyone, I think, always starts out in the crypto industry at some point. Um, but, you know, that didn't last long. Um, I was going to the meetups in the Dallas area at the time. Met some great Bitcoiners like Gary Leland and, and a few other OGs at the time. Um, you know, eventually got converted to Bitcoin only. Started my first, uh, started, my, started at my first Bitcoin job in 2018, just doing uh, certificates on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, I've worked with Natalie Spolinski. Some people may know her in the space. She does really good um, podcast appearances and a lot of good work in the political atmosphere of Bitcoin. But worked with her for a few years doing that. Um, ended up going over to Bottle Pay. Ended up going over to Impervious and then Voltage and then eventually starting my own company where I'm at now. So, uh, you know, it's been a wild ride. It's hard to believe it's been what, like five or six years already. But um, yeah, lightning stuff is where I have the most fun. So here I am in a lightning company. That is quite a journey. So how did you go from, you know, working at all these companies to then deciding you're ready to build your own company? Yeah, it's it's not easy. And especially since it has pretty much been all Bitcoin startups. So eventually, you know, you you pick up enough um, expertise and like what it even means to be in a startup. Like, you know, what's the worth ethic, you know, how, how do things operate? How do things run? Um, I would say if it wasn't for that, I probably wouldn't, you know, probably wouldn't have done it at all. Um, to be honest, because it is, there's a lot to running. I mean, there's a lot to working at a startup, but then there's a lot to running a startup and we're just three people at the moment with a few contractors and, you know, uh, every now and then. But uh, I would say that, you know, going from working at a Bitcoin startup or, or many Bitcoin startups to building your own really just comes down to like, you know, building on the side, you know, seeing what works, seeing what kind of things you're interested in, experiment with a lot of different things. Like you have the flexibility um, working at startups to 
build your own stuff and see what see what works. So eventually, you just build, build, build with your free time, uh, and then until something comes along that you feel really passionate about, that you found other people you're really passionate about with it, uh, and then just taking the leap. Um, that I mean, that's that's the hardest part as well. Like you know, coming to the decision, like, are we actually going to do this? And there was, you know, there was like, you know, a lot of long discussions, a lot of long talks, but it ended up being like, okay, this is, this is what we're going to do. Let's do it. Or can we actually do it? You know? So I think it, um, I think it only like took 30 days for us to raise enough money for us to quit our jobs once we actually started pitching ourselves. So um, that was super bullish for us to, to, do, to do and to hear from other people believe in us. Um, so then, yeah, I think it was like April 1st that we decided like that we've, um, all quit, you know, all started full time. And it's been, you know, three and a half, four months now. And it's been, uh, it's been a hell of a ride already. And it's, and we're just getting started. Awesome. Was there a particular catalyst while you were working at some of these Bitcoin companies where in your head, you kind of went, okay, I now have the confidence to do this. Like, I know I could do this on my own. Or was it just like the buildup of like an overwhelming urge to like, I have to do this idea. It's been bothering me for the longest time and it has to be done. Yeah, I think it's the latter there. They're overwhelming urge. Um, I mean, even when I started getting and started talking about lightning privacy, um, that's almost like pretty much what, you know, spiraled me down the rabbit hole that I'm, that I'm on today. Um, there was, there was the moment there. I think I remember tweeting like, okay, do, do I, do I start my own lightning, you know, privacy focused wallet? And at the time, there was a lot of like, well, you can build a lot of privacy things into existing wallets. Like, you know, you, we don't necessarily need another wallet. And I kind of agreed with that at the time. Uh, it seemed like a lot of effort to build a wallet. And, and it is a lot of effort to build a wallet. But um, I, I think eventually, especially seeing not much progress made on Lightning Privacy over the last, you know, three or so years, um, it, it just kind of became the point where it's like, you know, if, if I don't do it, like who is? Um, and then, and then there, you know, there's a, there's a few unique points that mutiny also comes in on. Um, and it was just like, wow, this is really cool. I think we have something here. I think we have something that would be really difficult for other people to pivot towards or to, to, you know, build on their own. So it just kind of made sense to like, okay, who's going to be able to do something like this? I think we are, um, and we, we want to do it. So it was just that the urge and everything like kind of you know, stacking upon each other in a, in a perfect way where it's just like, it, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense not to do it at this point. Mm -hmm. What were some of those privacy features that you had heard about people discussing and thinking about putting into wallets, but, but never ended up, you know, coming to fruition? Yeah, I think, I think route blinding has probably been the biggest one. It's the concept of being able to um, shield the recipient of a payment on Lightning, which has historically been the number one way where there's been privacy leak is, is the destination of payments are often, you know, viewable by the sender. Um, senders have good privacy on Lightning for the most part, but receivers don't. So one of the things that um, we've been waiting on for years, it used to call, it used to be called rendezvous routing. Um, I think all the way back in like 2018, it was like a concept. And then it ended up, you know, evolving a few times. And I think it just got merged a month or two back into the lightning spec. And now we're just waiting on implementations to finalize their version of route blinding. You know, it takes it takes two implementations to do it in order for it to get merged in the spec. So, you know, even if uh, I forget who was first in doing rendezvous, it was, it was probably async, um, the Claire implementation, but it needs two in order to get merged. So it's just competing priorities and, you know, it's no fault of anyone else's besides the fact that, you know, there's probably not enough protocol devs out there to, to do all of the things that we need to do to lightning. Um, and some of the privacy things have just kind of fallen through the gap. So one of the things that we our, our very first hackathon project where we built the first version of mutiny it was called PLN at the time. Um, just kind of stood for a private lightning network. It really wasn't a good name. We just had to come up with something for Akathon. Uh, the very first version of that had sends only. You, could all, you couldn't receive. It was only a sending wallet. Um, and specifically because we were like, okay, if we're going to be the privacy-focused lightning wallet, like we we're, we can't add receives until that's private. Um, we've done a few iterations since then. It's been about a year since that proof of concept uh, began. Um 
one of the things that we do to help receivers pri- privacy. We we have an article on this, but we haven't released it yet. But it's basically using the Voltage LSP as a way to shield the users from the outside world. So um, whenever an invoice is created by the user, instead of showing that to um, an outside party and them seeing the node pub key, and it's always the same node pub key every time uh, that correlates to the user, Instead of that, it always shows the Voltage LSP as the recipient of the payment. Now, the Voltage LSP can't take the funds. It's locked to the same secret that the user knows. So, you know, Voltage can't take those funds. Voltage doesn't have the knowledge of that secret unless the user redeems the payment. Um, but what it allows is now every user of that's using Voltage as the LSP is now has an anon set of every other user. So now, you you know, you're, you're hiding amongst all the... Uh, you're basically hiding behind an LSP, almost like a, almost like a VPN almost. So that's sort of like, you know, the things we have to do to try to get privacy today on lightning, it'll get a lot better in the future, but you know, people need privacy now, not later. And that's one of the big inspirations for wanting to do all this in the first place is that we can't, we can't wait until it gets better. We have to do what we can right now. Mm -hmm. I want to get into mutiny in just one second, but I want to make a comment on the uh, the point you made there about you know two lightning implementations being needed to push a feature. Um, do we need more lightning implementations? It, this seems like it's been a, a somewhat recurring theme. I've heard a few people discussing you know like things like Bolt twelve and other other features that people want to be put into lightning. I've heard a few people waiting on implementations to you know step up and 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 do and take that feature on. Um, and, you know, given that there's only a handful kind of of major implementations, do, do we need two times, five times, 10 times as many implementations? That's a good question. Um, so right now we're at four and I'm not sure if adding more will get things done faster per se. Mm. Um, only because, you know, there's some features that kind of need network level adoption, like Bolt 12 is one of those where, you know, we can have some implementations use Bolt 12, but if no node on the network supports the onion routing protocol for passing messages, messages around like custom, custom onion messages, then Bolt 12 doesn't really work. I mean, there's some workarounds that they're talking about using, um, but they're not, they're not great. Um, we kind of need the whole network to participate in some of those. Uh, trampoline is another one of those where we, we need more adoption. So like adding another implementation, I mean, it could help. I think we just need more devs on the implementations that exist or more priority on protocol level features. Um, there basically is a node implementation for all the major programming languages that there should be a implementation. in. so, it's just a matter of, uh, yeah, just getting more devs working on, you know, protocol stuff, not more implementations, just more protocol work and even spec work too. I mean, a lot of it is actually negotiations with the specs. I mean, the lightning protocol team, uh, teams, they all meet like every other week to talk about lightning protocol stuff, like what's next. So there's like active work all the time on it, but it's hard for all stakeholders to, really give it the attention that it needs. Right. Okay. So it's not that, you know, anyone is, is like sandbagging it or slowing down progress by not choosing to implement a feature. It's just that they have to prioritize features and they're, they're all kind of on different pages in and have different priorities as, you know, different entities. Exactly. But yeah. So if, if, if Bolt 12 isn't going fast enough, like there's probably some other things that other implementations are doing. Like, you know, L and D is probably the one that's, you know, it's quote unquote sandbagging the Bolt 12 protocol by not participating in it much. Um, but you know, that means that they're doing other protocol work. Like they're doing a lot of, um, taproot channel stuff. And I believe, you know, by an extension of that, eventually PTLC level stuff, um, and, and we need that as well. And I think so, th- you know, they're kind of working with the LDK team to do some taproot channel stuff. Um, and that that's important as well. So, you know, there's a lot of important things that everyone's working on. Uh, it just means that as there's more scatter, then we don't kind of get it all, you know, when we want them. Makes sense. Okay, let's get into mutiny. I want to start with just give folks a high level understanding. I had, I had been on, I think, episode 
89. We talked a little bit about Mutiny, but for anyone who is a new listener or who has not heard about Mutiny, what is it? Yeah, Mutiny is a self-custodial Lightning wallet. Um, we're trying to prioritize making it easy for people to get started with Lightning and, and Bitcoin in general. Um, one of the unique selling points that we have for Mutiny is that we're capable of running inside of web browser as well. So if you load up app.mutinywallet.com, you know, a Lightning node in the wallet, or sorry, a Lightning node in the web browser loads up right there. Um, it's making peer connections. It's, it's connecting to mempool.space for, to pull down blocks. Um, it's a live working Lightning wallet that's all self-custodial. Um, and you can even receive Lightning instantly without opening channels. So we use a just-in-time channel protocol, um, you know, zero conf channel to open a channel to the user when they need more inbound liquidity. So we're just trying to like prioritize literal the the onboarding for new users to get started with Lightning, and then also just to be a good spending wallet in general. So that's kind of like the way we're targeting. There's a lot of great lightning wallets already there's a lot of good bitcoin wallets there's you know there's you know cold storage and, and things like that and we're kind of coming in it from a different angle i'm um, trying to be like a an easy onboarding tool and then also a, a good spending wallet as well right now i think when a lot of people hear the words web browser and lightning wallet the first thing that pops in their head is something like a browser extension like albi can you talk about the similarities and differences between the approach that the Albi guys are taking and the Mutiny project. Yeah, um, and I think I think that's an interesting approach as well. The extensions. Uh, one of the things with extensions is that they are you know greatly limited by people actually installing the the extensions. Um, I think I think the Albi team is doing a really good job too because they have support for connecting to your own node remotely. Um, but one of the things that they have currently is that, you know, the default one, if you don't have your own node running somewhere, it is going through, uh, their custodian. So, you know, they have some like illegal liabilities to be honest. And, and also like, you know, there's rug pull risk from it being a custodian. Um, you could build something like mutiny inside of an extension as well. Um, I think one of the reasons we haven't done that is just simply because there's more users with access to a web browser than there's users access to uh, extensions. You got to install the extension, you got to install the right one. Um, and then also like you pretty much exclude all mobile users by, by having extensions. I think, I think Android has some support for it. I don't think on iOS there's any support for extensions at all. So I, I think you're pretty limited when it comes to that. Uh, and the way the Muni approach is, it's just you load up a link and it's boom, you have a, you have a web browser. Um, sorry, you have a wallet just by clicking a link or scanning the QR code. It's that easy, no extra download needed. Mm -hmm. And then on mobile is the, is the plan to stick with uh, web browsers or eventually venture into building an iOS and Android app? Yeah, so we already have an Android app. In fact, it only took, you know, we launched about two weeks ago and it only took like a week to get the Android version out as well. It was a lot quicker than we thought it would. Um, there's still some rough edges we got to clean up with it. So it's just an alpha build on our GitHub that people can download and let us know if it works well. Um, we're going to put it up, up on F-Droid and um, you know, probably the Google Play Store as well soon. But for now, we're just testing it out and that only took like five days. Um, I think we can get iOS walls as well. It just, it just turns into like, you know, one of the other reasons we, a big inspiration for doing it on the web is when I got censored from the apps play store or the iOS play store. So, uh, what ended up happening, me and me and Paul had a different business that we were doing consulting on the side and we wanted to spin up, uh, you know, an Apple dev account and push up and, uh, we wanted to push one of the first iterations of mutiny on the app store just to get it up there. And after doing all of their KYC and KY business stuff, they ended up saying I was a sanctioned individual and they had like absolutely no grounds for saying it. And I tried to repeal it like three times and they said that I was on some sanction list somewhere and they wouldn't say anything else about it. Um, and I, I believe me and Paul just looked up the messages, but it was like back in September and I just messaged him like, fuck it, dude, let's go to the web. They can't stop us there. And that's, that's been what we've been doing since is getting it to work on the web. So, um, you know, we'll, we will have apps, um, as well. And, and, you know, in iOS, maybe you'll eventually be able to sideload better. 
Um, but you know, one of the things is like at the very least, like we always have the web browser and that can never be taken away from us. Otherwise there's probably going to be features we're going to have to take out of our wallet to get approved in some of the app stores. Um, which is one of the reasons we'll probably just do F Droid first. So we don't have to deal with any of that and we just keep shipping. Um, but yeah, with app stores, the whole censorship thing is, is a problem. I mean, it's yeah. just like, you know, when you think about it, like, you know, Domus was, was censored a few months back. Other Nostra wallets are being censored for the use of like lightning payments that are not, you know, going through Apple. So they're not getting their 30%. When you think about all that, you start to wonder like what have apps, Bitcoin apps been, you know, stripping out of their apps this whole time that they've never been able to implement. Like what could we have seen Bitcoin usage be if every app didn't have to go through Apple? Like you don't hear about all the apps that get banned and all the app reviews that all these companies have to do. It's a lot. Like if you, especially when you get in the custodian game, when I'm, I'm not going to name names, but I was talking to one app, uh, you know, developer and from a major custodian, like they, they have to go back and forth all the time. It could be weeks for some of the app, like new features need to roll out across all platforms and they're waiting weeks to get approved by Apple um, for, for a feature that should, you know, should be no problem. So I, I think, you know, it, it's going to be really cool to see what we can do when we can have um, apps not, you know, self-censure themselves too. Uh, we have uh, we have the ability to do subscriptions in the app. And I think that's something that like no other Bitcoin wallet has is a way to monetize the dev team. Um, through subscription. So, you know, we kind of use something called Nostra Wallet Connect for that, but essentially is like we do a push notification to the user's phone in order for them to uh, renew their subscription to the Mutiny team um, and to the Mutiny Wallet. And so you can get Mutiny Plus, which right now doesn't really give you anything except uh, smug satisfaction, as, as we say in the wallet. Um, but, you know, there there is going to be paid only features that eventually come for the wallet. And and the way we can do that is because we can push subscriptions to the user. And I don't think that'll ever be allowed in the app store. <laughs> mm. Do you think that you'll be able to reach feature parity? Cause I know there's some things that you can only do in apps that you just can't do natively, like in a web browser. Um, will you be able to reach feature parity and build all these cool things in a web browser or through some PWA? Yeah, there's definitely some things that we can't do that I wish we could. Um, and then it'll be an open question of like, okay, do we do we end up forgetting that feature parity and just say, okay, well, the, the mobile app experience is going to be so much better. Maybe it's neutered by subscriptions and other things, but um, uh, NFC is one of the big ones, I think. Um, NFC and then the secure enclave for, uh, for their storage. So, and those are things you can only do in an app right now? Exactly. Yeah. Um, there is some NFC support on Chrome on Android. I think you even have to like turn it on. So it, it's like, okay, do we, do we spend some time building in features that like only, you know, 20 or 30% of people can actually use? Um, or do we you know, keep the feature parity even for the sake of, you know, not being too split? Um, we want to push out features that everyone can use. Um, but because of that, uh, we'll, we'll be missing out on some features like NFC. Mm -hmm. When you think about the lightning payment ecosystem as a whole, and if you look out a few years, what tools do you think people will be using to make these payments? Are they going to be primarily using, like, if you, if you think about the split globally of the number of people making lightning payments, is most of that activity going to come from self-custodial wallets? Is it going to be coming from, uh, you know, uh, cash app or strike or some other custodial solution? Is it going to be coming through apps? Is it going to be coming through a web browser? Like what does that mix look like? Yeah. I mean, I, th I think if we were to look at it today, it's, it's probably like 90% custodians, um, or and probably 90% apps as well. Right. Rather than browsers yeah yeah yeah. i mean the browser yeah i mean besides i think albie is the only other person in the browser game and and, and they're they're then extension so um mm -hmm. you know i would i would say now there's like ways to interface with your node and i think i think that's an interesting area you know you could say that that's not apps it's just app remotes so like albie can be treated as an app remote um zeus is a great app remote uh there's things like thunder hub as well 
that's all web browser based and that's more of an app remote. Uh, I think when you look at it today, it's, it's gotta be all, custo- you know, almost all custodians unless if, if it's, if it's, if it's based on the user's activity, like there's a lot of economic activity happening on lightning network between businesses and vendors. Um, for instance, like, um, you know, maybe open node is like depositing, you know, a bunch of sats into, uh, into, um, river, you know, so they can do a sell, you know, that's just like general economic activity happening on lightning. But I think when you think about like consumer payments, I think that's got to, be like 90 plus percent today it's, it's just going through custodians i mean they make it easy you can take advantage of all the channels that the custodian has so that you know you're not paying for a channel open you're not managing keys you're not doing any of the hard stuff um so it's like it's hard to blame people for how much uh custodian usage lightning has become today simply because it's not an easy task and it's I'm not saying like even Mutiny has solved that yet for users. I think there's still a lot of pain points that we have to work through in order to to make that better. Um, but I think historically it's it's all custodians. Where I want to see it is you know a lot more non custodian usage. Um, what we may end up seeing is that the percentage stays the same, but the level of adoption increases. Um, there's an argument still to be made that most Bitcoin usage is going to end up being through some Bitcoin bank. Um, I mean, I think even early Bitcoin talk users, I, I don't know if it was Hal Finney or, or Satoshi that said that, that, you know, they still see a world where Bitcoin banks will exist simply because of the complexities involved and, and the, and the scale, which Bitcoin, you know, can support on chain. Um, but at least being able to, what I don't want to see is if we're at like 90% custodianship, um, that goes up to 95% and then 99% and then, you know, maybe 100%. What I don't want to see that. If we can at least keep parity, maybe, you know, dip a little bit lower into, into seeing, um, you know, any anywhere below 90% and then keeping that as we scale, I think that would be huge progress um, for, for Bitcoin in general, but, but also for the Lightning Network. Right. And so there, do you see then a future where there is no, there are no custodians and that everyone is self-custodial or, or is it just a battle to try and get that number from 90% down to like 80% or maybe 70 or 60%? Yeah. I don't think there will ever be no custodians. Um, what I can maybe see is that there will still be, you know, there will be users that use both. And, and they might use both because their custodian is being shitty um, or they're censoring payments or they're like monitoring their transactions or they're like reporting everything and every bit of activity, you know? So at least like, I mean, I think you see this a lot today with some Bitcoiners where they'll send from Stripe to Wallet Satoshi. And then from there, they do whatever they want with their payments because it's now not being seen by Strike or maybe they do the same for Cash App and River. Um, I think being able to leave the custodian has never been easier with Lightning. I think that's one area where Lightning has shined. You you get those instant transactions and then you can turn around and do whatever you want. Um, you don't have to wait six confirmations. You don't have to wait for the custodian to do all the batching um, and, and monitoring of the transactions and all of that. So I think... I think lightning has been huge for being able to leave custodians in the first place. And, and, and I hopefully, hopefully we still see a lot of that. Um, we may end up having a situation where like there's level of volume, um, you know, like how many Bitcoin transactions are being sent out versus like, you know, the amounts itself. Like, you know, we, we may end up seeing like there'll be a lot of like non-custodial usage where there's just like high frequency of transactions. Meanwhile, custodians are still the ones doing the thousand plus thousand uh, dollars worth of transactions or more um, simply because they're in a better position to do it. Like non-custodial routing is, is not easy in a lot of times um, you got to manage your own channels and you have like not a great view of the graph. Uh, that's honestly been like the hardest part about mutiny right now is the fact that, you know, we, for one, we don't see anything. We don't see payments coming in or out. Um, we don't even run the LSP like voltage voltage runs the, that LSP. So we don't, we almost have like no level of insight uh, into, into the user's behaviors. Um, and, and so we also don't know like when payments succeed or when they fail and why they fail. Uh, that's all like on the end user. 
And when you're trying to make a payment within 30 seconds and you're trying all these routes on your client device and the, oh, payment, you know, payment failed, payment failed, payment failed. And then it's already been 30 seconds and the payment time's out. Then it's like, well, you know, that's a, that's a terrible experience. Uh, you have, you know, there's like 70,000 plus channels on the Lightning Network today. You know how many paths exist to any given node? It's, it's absolutely insane. It's, uh, <laughs> if anything keeps me up at night, it's like pathfinding on Lightning. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Voltage. Voltage empowers engineers to integrate Bitcoin and Lightning Network payments into their business stack with an enterprise-grade experience. The team at Voltage is building the complete tool set so that you can do more than simply spin up nodes, but also understand and interpret your node's data. Their new product, Surge, gives engineers the capability to quickly solve problems and optimize operations. With node insights and visibility through time series data, you get dynamic and complex insights never available before. You can get complete control with insanely fast onboarding, advanced client-side encryption, and zero management infrastructure, making backups, networking, and upgrades simple. Get a free seven-day trial today at Voltage.cloud. Talk to me a little bit more about the uh, Flow 2.0 product at Voltage. You guys are using that as your LSP. I believe you helped work on that, correct? Yeah, yeah. We uh, we built it up from the ground um, when we joined. So we when we when we joined Voltage back like last September or so, um, it was specifically so that we can build out the Voltage LSP so that we can move on and use it for mutiny. So like from the mm-hmm. get go, like we, you know, our plan was to leave voltage to start mutiny um, and to build the LSP along the way. So we, we did that um, and, and they've been great about it uh, and, and, and they've been great in supporting it and all, all the users on launch day. Um, but one of the cool things about that, you know, we built it on top of a CLN. And one of the reasons we did that is so that, you know, we thought we would eventually get splicing on CLN first before, before like something like Alan D or, or, or someone else. So uh, we thought it would be a good node to build an LSP on top of, I mean, we, I think we see, um, I think we see Breeze building on CLN as a lot more as well. Um, I'm not sure if it's their LSP or not, but there's, they're still doing a lot of CLN related things with green light. So it seemed like a good, like, starting point for it. So we built it on top of CLN. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we built it in a way where it kind of protects the user's privacy a little bit um, on the receiving end. Of course, if you're using any LSP, you know, they can still see transactions going in and out. They might not know where the destination is or anything like that, but they still see those transactions going in and out. But at least with the Voltage Flow 2.0 product, um, the outside world can't see in. So, you know, we get, we get a little bit of privacy from that regard. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's uh, the other interesting aspect of of it as well is the fact that the CLN LSP can work across any node implementation as well. So you can have this like just in time, zero comp channel stuff going on with your own personal LND node. You can hook it up to um, the voltage LSP and then anytime you need extra liquidity, they'll open a channel to you and send the payment along your way. Same thing, uh, you know, Muni is an LDK based node um, and it works well with LDK, Uh, CLM works well. You know, it's one of the only things where you actually see an LSP that can work across implementations. Historically, you see the Breeze LSP working with Breeze and you see uh, the Phoenix LSP, uh, you know, the Eclair LSP, working with with phoenix and uh moon is the only lsp for moon like you see these like wallets that are also lsps and one of the things about mutiny i mean we're we're you know a small team um with with only raised a small amount of money and so we didn't want to have to raise more money just to bootstrap liquidity for an lsp um so you know this is another reason why like partnering with partnering with voltage was a really great decision because they wanted to get into the lsp game but they didn't have a wallet. We wanted to get in the wallet game and we didn't want to have to raise money for liquidity. And so it was just like a perfect match um, all around. And and the fact that anyone can use the voltage LSP is just a really cool uh, aspect yeah. as well. That's awesome. I know there's, there's also like an LSP spec that's being worked on. Are you guys using that at Mutiny? Are you interested in that? I'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, um, we're definitely interested in it. I've, I've reviewed some of the specs. Um, I'm not like so active in it, but 
Um, it's it's a lot of work too. So some of that's just starting to get to the point where they can use it. Um, I think it's been a concept for maybe a year or so. And there's like, you know, four or five different specifications for like how LSPs can interoperate. I think in the beginning, there was sort of an LSP spec that was very simple. Um, it kind of just followed the way Breeze did their LSP. Uh, I think the um, uh, John Cavallo's wallet as well, uh, Synonym, I think they started using that first iteration. But I think the industry saw a need for like being more active at the protocol level for LSPs. And so they started doing a lot more advanced things and started writing specifications um, to almost treat like LSPs as an extension to Lightning. Um and I, and I think that's the, the, kind of what they're going for. And I think it'll work. I think it'll be really good. I, th I think any node should be able to be an LSP. Like if you're, if you're a routing node that has like, you know, 30 plus channels or so, and you try to keep those maintained, like, like, you know, right now, if you're trying to monetize just by routing alone, you probably aren't doing very well, to be honest, but there's no reason why you can't offer services, um, to general Bitcoin wallet users. So I think like an open LSP specification to allow anyone to pick their LSP, it uh, could be a friend, could be a family member, could be someone in the community, or it could just be, simply be someone like a zero fee routing, you know, where they just come on board and they end up getting a lot of liquidity and that they're offering services and in, in their own proprietary ways. Like you've seen LSPs do it in ways where like, oh, okay, you have to go to Amboss and use the Magma product and link your node and do all those things to get inbound liquidity. Or uh, BitRefill had their Tor product that you had to go through and do. I think I think they're starting to converge and trying to make that more of an extension of Lightning so that any Lightning user can, can connect to an LSP and any routing node can be an LSP for someone else. So I, th I think that's going to be huge for the network. Um, I think it may still take some time to fully build that out, but... Um, and we're talking to some people now and, and seeing if we can incorporate it easily. Right. So what are the second order consequences then of having that lower barrier to entry to becoming an LSP and, and more interoperability between LSPs? Yeah, I think one consequence is um, users selecting their LSP. Like how do, you, how do you expose that to people? Like that's one of the big questions that I have for any other LSP that like, comes to us and then wants to partner with us, it's like, okay, well, how do you, how do you think we should expose this to the user? Because we don't want the user to have to think about it. Um, simply they should open the wallet and there should, it should work. And as far as the user concerns, that's all it should be. So it's like, we're either selecting an LSP on behalf of the user by default, or we have to like build in some drop down tool with an explanation of what each LSP could do and their fees and all that and then like you know if they select the wrong lsp it could be end up being a reflection of the wallet it, itself so if you know if 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 in the muni wallet the default lsp was one that was just not reliable and, and didn't connect to many users people would think the muni wallet sucked so if people select the wrong lsp um you know they could think that muni wallet sucks or maybe they're well aware enough that they can switch to another lsp um I don't think switching LSPs is, is going to be an easier task because you may have channels already with, with a different LSP. And so do you close those channels? Do you like migrate in some way? Um, there's, there's a few tough questions for how to streamline the open LSP spec for users. I, I think what we'll end up seeing is that Wallace will just have a preference for which LSP they partner with. Um, and, and they'll probably ship those defaults to the user. Um, as far as like LSPs interacting with LSPs, um, I, I think that's probably the direction we're going to head towards is, is just a lot of routing nodes that are really well connected with the other LSPs. I mean, you kind of see this with like businesses today. Um, custodians like Strike and River, Cash App, um, they'll typically have channels with some of the destinations that end up being more popular. Um, I would love to see it be something where, you know, maybe a custodian has a direct channel with a bunch of different LSPs. And so, so that way payments to the LSPs go really fast and, and are really easy. And then vice versa, users of those LSPs can always get payments into the custodians to sell Bitcoin or do whatever as needed as well. So I, I, I see LSPs interacting um, 
you know, quite heavily in the future, especially we have, we have an open LSP market. Like there's some competition there, but I think for the most part, we're all just trying to get a better user experience on top of Lightning. Right. I, I saw one interesting thing when I was kind of browsing through Mutiny Wallet and some of your docs and stuff. You refer to Mutiny as a spending wallet. Why do you make that distinction? Why yeah. An earning wallet or some other term. Yeah. I mean, it could, it could be an earning wallet as well. I, I, I see, I mean, for one, um, you know, being in the browser isn't the best security. I mean, I, I think we fully acknowledge that. <clears throat> um, it, you know, ideally when, when you think about wallets and like their roles, um, you know, there's, there's cold storage, which, you know, it should be harder to access and should be offline. And that's where you keep your life savings. Like I, I, I call them the life savings wallets, uh, to put it, to put it frankly. Um, then there's maybe the more hottish type wallets where like, okay, you'll, you'll, you'll keep some more Bitcoin on there, but it's more of like, you know, the money in your bank account. It's, it's still not your life savings. Um, but you, you should be able to like interact with things from there. Uh, then I see like this whole class of spending wallets where it's like, okay, um, you, you keep, what you would keep in your wallet normally. And that satisfies your day-to-day -day spending. It satisfies, you know, you're using it a lot. Like one of the, one of the things that we do uh, at Mutiny is like have interactions with um, the uh, Noster. So we have Noster Wallet Connect. You can zap other profiles with Noster. It works pretty, pretty easy. And that's like, I think one of the things that users pretty much do the most is zap other users. Um, the thing about that is that it ends up being like a great spending wallet because of that. So it's like people are using Mutiny Wallet every day. They're, they're confirming their zaps and they're sending them out. And, and it's not like hundreds of dollars worth of transactions. It's like, it's like 30 cents here and there, like a dollar, $2, $3. Like, you know, not, not saying that we can't, um, you know, support more than that, or you shouldn't use, use it for more. I just think that we can make like daily activity on lightning like a lot better and i, I think that's where we're going to try to come in on is is using it for like a daily spending wallet instead of just a um you know it's not a life savings wallet it's not it's not even something that you would probably keep thousands of dollars on it's simply for like a hundred dollars or less and you can top it up as you go like that's the beauty of lightning is that you know you have channels and you deplete those channels and now you can fill it back up um without even needing to open a new channel. You just, you just pause it right back in. Right. I want to hear your view on the folks who say, because this is lightning, because the amounts are small, we don't need self custodial tools. We can just do it all custodially because the, the amounts aren't, aren't enormous. It's not my life savings. What do you say to those folks? Yeah. I mean, there's some truth to it. Um, I mean, they're, they're not wrong. I mean, their risk profile is that if the custodian rugged them, they would only lose 40 or 50 bucks. Um, I, one of the, one of the things I see with it is that some of these custodians uh, that people are using are, are non KYC custodians as well. And, you know, not, not to throw them under the bus, but that's a huge regulatory risk to be operating a non-KYC custodian in this day and age. It historically has not ended well. Um, there's a lot of like there's a lot of different like either they shut down um, or they shotgun KYC or they they get um, they get taken over by law enforcement. Like that's historically what we've seen, and that's one of the things that like I would hate I would hate to see that. But I think it's inevitable. And and then when you look at applications on top of Lightning, um, they shouldn't have to be a custodian either uh, to, to have the same risks involved in that. So, um, so, you know, maybe there's an argument to be made that like, okay, well, maybe have more interactions with like legit custodians um, and, and there's less risk of rug pull, but it kind of comes down to the privacy aspect and, and, you know, what they see, uh, the, the fact that they can shut down your account at any time, they're often, you know, understaffed and under resourced when it comes to like compliant constraints and they just, they just do what they need to do. And I think that turns into a PayPal situation where people are just getting shut down for no reason, or they had a different view or they made the wrong transaction to the wrong person. And that's like extra scrutiny. The user is, is facing simply by, by trying to just 
be a user of Lightning. So, I mean, I want to see more non-custodial usage because like Bitcoin is supposed to be censorship resistant. And I think Lightning should be as well. And if we want to see that grow, um, we have to push for more non-custodial usage. Right. That makes sense. I want to talk about distribution a little bit. And, you know, I, I see a lot of Lightning wallets that exist now. A lot of times when I'm using a Lightning app and I'm say, let's say I'm playing a game and I earn 100 sats and I want to withdraw the sats. I'm, as a user, making that decision of like which wallet I'm going to withdraw to. I wonder, have you thought at all about like how to get distribution by like, can you become the default wallet that everyone selects through? Is there an advantage to building on the web uh, where, where you can kind of like make Mutiny the place that people, you know, choose to go to by default? I'd love to understand how you separate yourselves while you have, you know, now a dozen wallet competitors, whether they're self-custodial or custodial. Yeah, some of some of that. So we are on the web and, and you can, quote unquote, install it as a progressive web app. Um, one of the things that we also don't get uh, is the app app links themselves. So where it just like hot clicks over and, you know, it handles the Bitcoin URI or the lightning URI when you when So when you open a lightning invoice in the app, in the app, it may ask you, okay. It may, if uh, I think on Android, it'll try to auto open any Bitcoin wallet you have installed. Uh, I think same with iOS. I think with iOS, it's a little funky because it'll just pick one for you. And yeah, I think iOS does the last one, the the recent, the most recent one you installed. <laughs> right. So people are building in their own wallet selectors into a lot of different apps so that they can, and it, it doesn't, it can't even tell which one's installed. So you see a list of like twelve different wallets, and you're supposed to select one. Um, we, we, we don't get those hot link, uh, uh, um, actions that we can take advantage of being a PWA. Um, however, we can do something where we're an app click away and it just opens up app.mutinywallet.com in the web browser. And then boom, they have, they have the wallet. Um, I think that's about as close as we get to with just the web browser itself. The other thing I would like to see a lot is more Nostra Wallet Connect usage in Bitcoin wallets. It pretty much just like removes the need to um, maybe even open the wallet itself. If you have your own node set up at home and you linked it up with Nostra Wallet Connect and you go through like the checkout experiment, like say for instance, it's BitRefill and you, you know, do one time link of your Nostra Wallet Connect that points to your node. Anytime after that, you can have it, when you go through the checkout process, it just, you know, takes the sats right from your wallet. Now you can set up like, you can set up like permissions and you can set up like amounts and frequency and like all kinds of other things to make sure it just doesn't pull out sats when it, when it shouldn't. Um, but I mean, it, it's kind of like, it's kind of similar to a, a credit card checkout flow where you, where you link it one time and then it has permission to. Um, pull from funds from your wallet. The way we handle that mutiny is that we ask the user every time, hey, did you want to pay this invoice for this specific merchant that you set up with one time? So we do it for Zaps. And that's that's one of the things that you know we're seeing a lot of users actually use. So every time you zap someone and you linked up your mutiny wallet as the uh, as the as the Nostra wallet connect option, um, the next time you open Mutiny Wallet again, it'll have a list of all your different zaps that you try to do. And, you know, if you ever see one that, like, you know, shouldn't be there, you can hit decline. Um, but otherwise, you're just, like, approving them all, and then and then it sends out the payments. You can do the same thing with checkout. You can do the same thing for subscriptions. Um, any Anywhere there's an invoice to be paid, um, you can integrate it with Nostra Wallet Connect. And, and so not to say that, like um, – not to say that the whole industry should move towards that, but because for one that we, we can't get those app intentions, um, those app links. And, and for two, we can't use something like L one URL in a mobile context because there's not a server online on the user's phone 
Um, so like Nostra kind of like solves this beautifully where it's just like, you know, almost serverless architecture where it just like connects to any Nostra relay and sees if it has invoices to be paid, any Nostra wall connect messages. And it just, it just asks you if you want to pay them, no need to like sign, you know, pull out your phone and scan a QR code. You can just, you can just link up your wallet one time with an app and then, uh, approve payments straight from your wallet. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm zapping people on Domus, the zap, I'm, I'm clicking zap and the zap doesn't actually happen though, until I've gone back into mutiny and just like approve said thumbs up. Is there a way, can I, can I set that up to like auto approve if I choose? Yeah, we haven't added, that was how it was originally. Um, but when we launched, we got rid of the auto approval and we, we wanted to make it manual to start out with. We wanted to see how well it, it worked out, like, you know, to visually see the payment show up. And I think there's improvements that we're going to have to make before we, we make the auto approval. Like sometimes get, there's a delay when there shouldn't be. And sometimes it may repeat an invoice again that it shouldn't. I mean, it won't pay it again. It'll it'll stop you from from paying the same invoice twice, but sometimes it'll show up again. So I think there's some uh, some bugs we got to sort through before we allow auto approval to happen. And then we got to add the, the all the stuff around um, safeguarding the the amount. So making sure that you know it, it, the auto approval up to 10k sats, you know, or 10k sats a day or 10k sats a week. Like we we got to add those things as well. Like I mean, it is like it is a brand new technology, you know, Nostra itself, and then also Nostra Wall Connect. Um, and, and we don't want users to lose funds because they forgot that there is a Nostra wall connection thing happening with Domus. And then they just started, you know, zapping away or, 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 you know, maybe they're using Zapple pay as it were any emoji, you know, thumbs up or lightning bolt symbol is withdrawing sats from their wallet. Um, one user did reach out and they were saying that like they were, continuing to get invoice requests even though they like delinked it properly or, or they thought they did um so there's like some user it's like protecting the user at the end of the day we don't want to see users wallet balances deplete when they don't expect it so for now we're, we're just doing manual approvals but you know when, when when we can nail down the um the auto approval with amount um max capacity i, I think we'll want to do that as well yeah so it seems like Noster is now becoming like a really important infrastructure piece for wallets. I want to understand a little bit more about why Noster Wallet Connect, why not Web Wallet Connect or Mutiny Wallet Connect? Why why is Noster specifically like an important piece to this puzzle? Yeah, there, there's a lot there that I think Bitcoin wallets or even just apps in general can take advantage of with, with Noster. Um, for one, it's the always online nature, kind of like I mentioned before. Um, LNURL pen, LNURL withdrawal, they work really well, but they're historically you historically meant for either custodians or you know you run your own server at home, or maybe you have a voltage node um, that you have always online. Like so, it 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 it's not accessible to a large amount of people. Um, it's it's accessible to people with servers, um, and and that's not the most amount of people. Uh, so Nostra Wall Connect and Nostra in general works really well in asynchronous context where you don't need to be online all the time in order to interact with a Lightning Wallet or application itself. So um, requesting an invoice, like when, when you're zapping people, you don't need those payments to go out immediately. They can go out whenever, and and if some fail, so be it. There's no harm, no foul. You know, your your hundred sat zap didn't go anywhere. You know, no one no one cares. Um, so in this context, I think, I think it's, you know, even if there's some failures or, or, or there's some latency there, uh, it's, it's no problem at all to have something, something like Noster. Um, I was trying to think like on, on the flip side, I think a lot of applications can kind of standardize around a single protocol. And I think that's, you know, we saw that play out with LN URL. It, it, it got a lot of adoption really quickly. Um, people loved how easy it was to work with. I hope that something like NOS Wall Connect can be something that multiple wallets implement. So far, we have, I think we just have Albi, Mutiny, um, and there, I think there's a few like programs you can run on Umbral or something that allows you to interact with your own node in a NOS Wall Connect way. So, like, we're starting to see some adoption for NOS Wall Connect. And 
if it was just Mutiny Connect, then it's like, okay, now we have to try to get everyone to add Mutiny Connect to their Nostra clients um, or, or applications. And then, and, you know, if you've ever been annoyed at a checkout page that has like 10 buttons on there, it's like Amazon Pay, Google Pay, Apple Pay, checkout.com, like, you know, it's annoying. And, and, and that's just a lack of protocols not being standardized and, uh, and proprietary customer, uh, proprietary businesses, um, you know, interacting with custodians basically. So uh, because Albi, Albi did a lot of good work, uh, standardizing Osterall Connect and pushing for adoption with it. So we, we kind of, in, in a way like got, a, you know, got a free lunch here where it's like, Oh, now we implement Osterall Connect and now we're, um, anyone can interact with us just like they would interact with Albi. I hope more Bitcoin wallets start to implement that. Um, because they see a value in having something for their mobile users that aren't LNURL, that don't require a server, but is still interoperable and, and can still work in a mobile context. So I'm, I'm bullish on more Nostra things for, for Bitcoin apps, simply from that asynchronous nature and then also the interoperability. Yeah. I want to touch on uh, two more features you guys are planning to build into Mutiny, one being coin joins and one being synthetic dollars via DLCs. Can you talk to me a little bit about how those two will work and what the kind of roadmap is for implementing them? Yeah. So coin joins, th this is a fun one. Um, we, you know, Ben Carmen started building out Vortex um, maybe a year ago, maybe, maybe a year and a half ago at this point. I think he was on your podcast talking about Vortex as well when he was on. Um, and I think one of the things he's been saying lately, or, or at least like as of like six months ago or so, is that it's been hard to actually, you know, Vortex has been ready, but it's hard to actually push out to end users simply because he has a lot less control of what the wallet does itself. So like when he's interfacing with an LND node, um, he doesn't get full control over that wallet. He's just restricted the APIs that he gets. Um, maybe I'm jumping into the weeds too much with like why he's moving off of, off of that. But essentially like the coin join aspect is um, you can open up lightning channels as part of a coin join. Uh, maybe in the future you can close lightning channels as part of a coin join. And it just like brings coin join into the lightning layer. I think the next evolution of that will be uh, splicing in coin join where you can have a lightning channel with another node and that's locked in place. You know, that's had six plus confirmations and then you splice in and out afterwards. And as you splice, like splicing is basically just like taking part of your channel funds and either increasing the capacity or lowering the capacity in order to do on-chain transactions. So you can, instead of closing your channel, waiting for confirmations, sending those Bitcoin out and then opening the channel again, that's like four different transactions if you're, or three different transactions. You do it in one go. It's just one transaction and you either send an on-chain payment or you add in an on-chain payment into it and now you've increased your capacity. And that all works with zero downtime. So you can add coin joins to that where you're splicing in and out. You're doing coin joins with that channel still open. Um, you're, and, and if you're doing it properly, it's not even changing the capacity of your lightning channel. It's just literally swapping in and out the UTXOs you're using um, combined with uh, every other person that's doing the coin join with you as well. Um, sort of a way, you, and it, let's say you were a routing node doing that too. You can even level up even more where you're getting yield doing routing, you know, routing payments. Maybe you're getting yield being an LSP as well. Meanwhile, you're coin joining your funds in the background as well. And maybe you're getting yield for that, or maybe you're not, and you don't care because you're getting yield on Lightning, but you're still getting better privacy because you're coin joining all your funds locked up in channel. So I think I think that's like a huge step up in, in, in privacy. And um, you know, it's almost something you get for free if you're able to coin join with the fun. I mean, a Lightning node, if you're a routing node, you have to be always online anyways. And if you're doing active coin joins, you have to be always online pretty much as well, or you, you have to be online to wait for that coin join to happen, you know, which could take hours or, or days sometimes, depending on the coin join implementation. Um, 
sorry, so that, that's just like general where I see coin join and lightning intersecting. And eventually that's something we want to add uh, to mutiny as well, specifically building on some of the work that Ben has done with Vortex to try to get channel opens to happen in a coin join. Um, that was kind of like the first step in doing that and he had like i mentioned earlier he had some difficulty doing that and wanted to um you know he kind of figured he had to build his own wallet if he wanted to do it properly so he came and and, and started building his wallet with us there you go and so there there could be like a few different avenues here that are are developing for lightning routing nodes to earn money right through a coin join as an lsp with this lsp spec and just routing payments right there's now like multiple possible revenue streams for, does this, does this make it a little bit more feasible for someone to go, yeah, I'm going to run a routing node as a business? Maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, I only say maybe because historically that was almost the promise with lightning in the beginning, um, get, get yield off of routing payments. And most people don't. You know, right. make, make a profit. I think there was a really good Stacker News article maybe a month ago of this guy breaking down and he was like, I've been running a routing node for three years and here's how much money I have lost. <laughs> and it's, uh, you're not like loss, loss. So just like in fees and like in, in payments and on-chain transactions, force closures, like all these things happen in Lightning and it costs money to do it. And um, turns out like if you're not a major custodian or you're not, a huge routing node like Alex Bosworth, then you know, you're not really making a profit. Um, I think Alex loves to tout that he makes thousands and thousands a month routing payments. Um, and it's almost like luring people in to running routing nodes, thinking they're going to make thousands and thousands a month. And that's not the reality. So I would, I would hate to say that there, there's multiple atmos- um, business models for, for a lightning node uh, to, in the future, but I wouldn't want to say that, you know, Good luck trying to make a profit. Um, I think you, if if you really wanted to be a, a skill, like almost operate it like a business, um, I think I think there's avenues for that. But I think long is gone of the person with an Umbro node that never uses it or logs in to it is going to make profit at all. Right. Just not a. There's no passive income. There's yeah. no like, especially if you don't have capital or any interest in maintaining a node and doing all the difficult things that come with operating one. Exactly. I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Just a quick message from our sponsor, Stackwork. Stackwork is a lightning powered platform for generating high quality transcripts of all your audio or video content. They combine AI engines and hundreds of human workers all over the world who are paid over the lightning network to assemble these transcripts. And that's what lets Stackwork create better, faster, and less expensive transcripts. To see the results for yourself, you can check out my personal website where I host transcripts for all my podcast episodes. If you want to learn more about Stackwork, visit stackwork.com. That is S-T-A-K work.com. I want to shift gears and talk about a, a blog post you wrote. I guess it was a, a week or two ago. I saw it on Stacker News. Um, this was lightning everywhere. And... Um, you know, you started the blog post off. I just want to read a little snippet from it and we can kind of riff on this. Uh, you said lightning usage is growing and while it may be far from perfect and might not have some of the mass adoption we would have wanted by now, the superior payment technology will win out. Um, and I want to just pose this as a question of like, why, you know, we're, we're all lightning believers and we're all excited about lightning. And like, I think there's a good chance that superior payment tech does win out. But why is it that it must win out, or what? What is? What are the uh, reasons why you know the superior payment technology is enough here? Like, because because we started to see some competitors emerge, right? People, you know, outside of the Bitcoin ecosystem, like to say, well, look, now we have instant payments through FedNow, or now we have you know CBDC A, or whatever whatever kind of like new currency has been spun up in attempts to build in instant payments. Worldcoin, all these, all these kind of schemes have popped up recently, um, and and now I, you know, I think it's important to, you know, face this question of like, why does, why is it enough to be the superior payment technology, uh, when some of these other, you know, proposals and ideas may have more distribution or more funding or more kind of like 
other benefits beyond just the technology itself? Yeah, uh, I think there was two things that I was thinking about in my mind when I wrote that. And one aspect is Bitcoin itself. Um, you know, I, I do believe Bitcoin is, is for one, the superior currency. Um, it may not be the best payment network, per se. I think that's where Lightning comes in. Um, but uh, Bitcoin itself, I mean, I think if the Bitcoin thesis plays out the way it has and, and it continue, I believe it continue will, uh, will play out. Um, I mean, CBDCs, there, there, there's so many problems with them from, I mean, there's either like censorship problems or there's like, um, there, there's, there's risk of rug pulls. There's the monetary aspect of a well, like, you know, how much is it actually worth? Like, is it, is it a fair distribution model? Like, I think, I think there's like an argument to be made and, and, you know, this is a Bitcoin podcast, so I don't, I don't think I have to explain all of that, but I mean, Bitcoin itself compared to other things like Worldcoin or CBDCs or, or FedNow. I mean, I think, I think it, those will either play out to just show the problems with them. I think there is a downward trajectory to anything fiat related. And I don't see that getting better. I only see that getting worse from either a privacy perspective or a censorship perspective. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time before people realize that, you know, I mean, I think it was just this week that you know, so many, I've saw so many reports about people's chase accounts getting shut down because they had something to do with some health related thing that was not the status quo of, of, of the whole COVID narrative. Um, and, and so I, I, I think PayPal has, has, you know, pretty much proved out a decade ago, um, really like why, why we need like a decentralized internet currency. I think banks collapsing, um, proves that out more and more. So I, I, I think that it's just inevitable that Bitcoin will win out for one. Um, but the other side of it too is okay. Is Lightning going to be the thing that is the superior network um, for for payments? And so, like, if if we have this baseline understanding that Bitcoin will in some way, there's the other aspect of like what what layer two is going to be the payment network, or is it going to be layer three? Like, um, and I had this whole section in here that I that I took out, but it essentially came down to. You know, even if there are other layers that are pretty good as well, I mean, there's there's stuff like Arc, um, there's there's Fediment as well that could be considered another layer. Um, there's like state chain stuff. There's Liquid. There's all these other layer twos that could exist or or, or do exist, and I still see them interoperating with Lightning in some way today, and and it's because you know Lightning has that adoption. It has that like payment channel that is all derived directly on chain. Like, you know, as you start getting into other layers, they start getting into other different concerns. Like, you know, Liquid is on a whole different blockchain that, you know, interfaces with Bitcoin when, when you peg in and it's like completely custodial when you peg out and there's problems with the peg out process. There, there's problems with how long it takes to do that. But hey, that's why they have a Lightning Network on top of Liquid. And that's why they interface with with the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Um I think I think if if Arc ends up being something that you know comes to fruition, um, it's going to interface with Lightning a lot. I mean, it kind of has to. It has this huge bootstrap problem that it has to solve. And Lightning is just like it's when you when you think about the role that Lightning has, even if you just think about like I have a payment channel with you, and nothing can stop that. Um, sure, it's an on-chain Bitcoin transaction, and sure we may get into a scenario where that's unreasonable. For me to have a Bitcoin transaction with all the merchants or the people I interact with, but nothing can stop that payment channel between us, um, and no one even has to know it exists. Even if it's just me, a random node, and I spin it up just to talk to you, um, no one can stop that. And and if you apply that out to a bigger scale, I think even when you have other layers that interact with each other, at the very least, I think you're going to have a direct payment channel between the two, and you could get into something where it's channel factories. So you have like direct interactions between the major layers and um, and this payment channel that exists that they all interoperate. They all convert, even if they're talking different languages day to day with their user. Um, I think the convergence is going to be lightning simply because like it's a beautiful payment channel at the end of the day um, that no one can stop, that that everyone can speak. It's just, a t you know, it's basically Bitcoin scripts at its core um, and, and it should be interoperable with everyone else. So and, and and the benefits you get from it as a network is now you can pay other people that could be 10 hops away or whatever. You don't have a direct channel with them and that's fine. I think that's like, 
that's to me more risky than lightning itself. I, I don't know if it's going to turn out to be that this, that there's going to be one lightning network that everyone interacts with and can talk to. There could be, there could be a couple, there could be some segregation. There could be pockets of lightning networks. There could be like, uh, you know, Matt likes to call Matt O'Dell likes to call them like custodial or not custodial, like regulated lightning networks where they're all speaking some regulated protocol, like something, uh, something like fat enough FASFA or I don't know, or any, any yeah. regulated institution like spins up. Um, but lightning at its core, I think is what wins out because it is just a simple payment channel between two parties. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I, I a hundred percent agree with the, uh, superior payment technology part of it. And I see all, a lot of the interoperability with, you know, liquid and potentially arc and things like that. Um, I, my, my point here kind of comes from the angle of like, you know, I look at something in the past, like the, the keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard, right? Like this was like a relic of typewriters, right? Where, you know, you needed to have the, the keys in that position because people were going to type words. If they didn't want to have people typing words, I believe too close together or letters too close together and jamming up the typewriter. And so the keyboard was designed for that antiquated purpose. And then, you know, many people have come up with superior keyboard setups for computers and just have never been able to overcome that established network effect. So I, I'm thinking more along the lines of that, of like, you know, how do we make sure that lightning even though it has that superior payment technology and is like in theory better at doing all these things, how do we make sure it actually wins and like gets around some of these fiat, you know, antiquated systems that are already pretty well established? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good point that, that, that being better tech doesn't, doesn't necessarily win out. Um, the, the keyboard example is an interesting one because, you know, nothing stops you from setting up your keyboard the way you want to. And, and there's, you can always just pick up the keycap and move it somewhere else. Well, maybe not if you have a laptop, but like normal, normal keyboards, you can. Um, and, and nothing stops you from doing that. The keyboard itself um, is sort of like the technology and like the keys are almost the layers there. So it's like, even if you can have different layers, like there's still that core tech that's powering them. Um, I see it more as like, um, the, the, the network level adoption, the user adoption of lightning, um, that's, that's a challenging part that we have to, you know, if we do want to turn lightning network into like an end user network that they interact with, we either have to make it easy or we have to do the education or we wait for the other things to just like fall apart. Um, and I don't, I don't like waiting. So I try to do the first two, um, so I, I agree with you on like, it's not enough to just like build it. Um, it you know, we, we do want to get users to adopt it. Um, but I think even if users don't adopt it, um, I think there's still a big enough case for major players to adopt it and, or it being used without the user knowing. To mm -hmm. me, I would prefer the user never even knowing they're interacting with Lightning and it just shows it's Bitcoin. And all the other stuff happens under the hood. Um, all they need to know is that they're using Bitcoin. Um, and honestly, like, I don't even, like, part of the article I wrote about, like, well, let's just treat it as points. You know, everyone knows Starbucks points, airline miles, all of that. Um, users have gotten acquainted with that. And you don't say we need more adoption for airline miles or Starbucks points. It's users use it because it's in the app and it works and they understand the concept of points. Um, I would love to see more Bitcoin wallets treat Bitcoin as points or not wallets, sorry, more apps treat Bitcoin as points and just abstract the whole idea that you're using Bitcoin at all. And, and, but like if they dive into like the settings or they, they see like a withdraw button and they're like, Oh, what I can withdraw or I can take these points out or can maybe even say convert these points to Bitcoin. Um, for, or they just leave it in the app and they interact with the points as is. So like, I mean, the less users know about Bitcoin or the layers that they're using of Bitcoin. I think that's better. Um, and I think the adoption will just come from apps seeing it as, as the better payment technology, the developers building on the tech, see it as a better payment technology that it is, um, or major players involved in e-commerce seeing it as the major tech and then, you know, developers interfacing with them. So like, 
I don't I don't care if users ever see that Lightning is the better tech. Um, I would rather them just be using Bitcoin and that's just what they're using is the better tech because the developers set them up with Lightning or whatever business they're using is using Lightning under the hood. Yeah, and, and just because the developer has that incentive to use the cheapest and fastest payment rail, they understand the superior technology and they pass that understanding along to the user without the user having to see and make that decision for themselves. Exactly. I think that's like a, a really realistic outcome and something that I think, you know, especially is it, it starts to really spin, the flywheel starts to spin once you get a few people using it. And once you have like a number of, if you have, you know, strike going from US to El Salvador and a couple other countries, and then you have someone else going to a few other countries and you start to build a web of like connected companies that are all leveraging the same network. And even if they're still using dollars or whatever currency on the front end, it's all using lightning and it's all just like moving faster than ever. I think that's, that's a really, um, it's a compelling you know, reason to, to believe in, in lightning becoming this like global payment rail, even if not everyone interacts with it directly on a daily basis. Yep, exactly. And, and I think people will see the benefits of lightning or the use cases of lightning for what they want to use it for. It's going to be different mm -hmm. for everyone. And I think you know, your use case of using it for remittances to El Salvador um, <clears throat> may just be one of those things that that might be all, the only reason they use Lightning or Bitcoin in general, but that's enough to be life-changing for them. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, yeah, I think I think people will see their own use cases and see Bitcoin's going to be different for everyone. And I, I, I think Lightning is can be the extension of that um, if we can build it for more use cases. Right. I want to touch on a couple more uh, things in this article. So you go on in the article to talk about Fetty and incorporating incorporating Fetty potentially into Mutiny. And I want to understand your views on the, you know, Fetty. I spoke with Cody a little while ago, and he was talking about the second party custody model. Um, would love to understand your views on whether or not you want to kind of like onboard users through this second party custody rather than third party custody. Whether you think, I think in the article, you also described the, the challenge of like, if you start someone out on third party custody, good luck, you know, convincing them to go to first party later, you're probably not going to spend the time to like educate them to, to make that leap. Is it an easier leap if you start them with second party custody and then try and move them over to first? We'd love to understand, you know, your views on, on that dynamic. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think one of the views doesn't necessarily mean it's for you know third party versus second party i think when you look at like the different experiences that people have with bitcoin for the first time um if they're having an experience where they're going to a dedicated app that's custodian only and and to them that's what bitcoin is they're using it they're learning about it maybe they're making payments maybe they're receiving payments um to them that's what bitcoin is and if they try to move off of that, there's two problems. For one, they got to go to a different app um, and have a whole different experience. Um, and then for some users, especially if they don't really know much about Bitcoin, that could be an intimidating experience. Um, they just got used to the app that they were using and all the nuances with it. Um, but for two, if it's a non-custodial wallet that they're moving towards, there's a whole bunch of different trade-offs that, that they were not used to before. Um, so then it turns into an education problem about, okay, how do you tell them, oh, well, what were you using before? You know, uh, you may not, you know, if you're building in an app, you may not know what they're using before. You may not know if they ever had a concept of channels or, or anything else. So like there's all these problems that moving from non-custodial, sorry, moving from custodial to non-custodial with two different wallets, you have all these like hurdles that the user has to go through. Now, most of them are mental hurdles, and then there there are educational hurdles hurdles to get across as well. Um, if you can build the same into the same wallet, where maybe it starts out um, custodial, um, or you know, to me, the federated custodial is just a better trade off, and and you get more privacy from it. But if you build it into the same wallet, you can start to like mimic the experiences on both as much as you can, because you're in control, like from a developer point of view, we would be in control of what the user sees on both sides 
whether they're on custodial or federated custodial versus non-custodial. Um, and then you can kind of like educate them about the trade-offs are being made. So like one of the things that I think we want to be able to do, um, the, the only reason I think we have to do it is just because there are minimum amounts required to like open up a lighting channel. You can't, you know, you, you can't onboard everyone in the whole world to the lightning channel today. Um, for one, they have to acquire enough Bitcoin to open that channel in the first place. So like we have a minimum of like 50 K sats, if you want to use mutiny on lightning, otherwise it just doesn't make sense to open the channel. Um, so, you know, we can, but with, with like a federated model, like with Fediment, a user can receive, like a brand new user could receive 100 sats, just like that. Uh, it could be one sat, you know, any amount of sats that they could receive without like extra fees, without any on-chain fees, without any um, um, hurdles around that, without any minimums. But they can send that, you know, 100 sats out to the network, no problem. Just like, you know, it, Fetty, this is where like Fetty Mint uses Lightning, just like I think any layer will need to incorporate Lightning. So you start to get in a scenario where, you're in the same app, let the user acquire enough sats in the app, then, you know, maybe prompt them, okay, now you have enough to open your first lightning channel. And you can try to make that as good of an experience as possible and an educational experience as well. Um, but that helps ensure that the app developer is trying to do what's best for the user, which is like get them off custodians and get them into uh, their own, you know, self-custodial lightning channel. Uh, to send sats the way they want to send sats and, and to have that control without the rug pull risk. Um, and then it just also ensures that like not too many users are using the wallet with like too much funds on the federated side. Meanwhile, like nothing today um, is stopping someone from acquiring too many sats on Fediman or too many sats on Wasatoshi or any other custodian. They just like, you know, dump as much sats as you want. Um, and, and then now you have to go back to the user or like your friend that onboarded them has to go back and say, Hey, you now have too much sats on here. You should withdraw. Uh, but I don't think that's really happening enough today. I don't think people are going back to, um, you know, the coffee shop in El Salvador or, or, or Guatemala and, and trying to get them to use a custodial wallet. I think they're just going back to their country and hoping it worked out well for the person they onboarded a Bitcoin through, uh, through a custodian that might shut down. <laughs> right. That makes sense. Um, one other point I wanted to touch on was you mentioned at the end of your article, uh, validating lightning signer this VLS project, um, and potentially using that at mutiny as well to separate keys. I think, uh, what impact do you think actually maybe you can give a, a high level overview of the VLS project and just, Explain the impact that you think this could have on kind of lightning as a whole. Yeah. Um, validating lightning signer, it's kind of this way where you can take the keys off, um, off whatever service you're using. So like in our context, uh, the keys could be in a mobile app, but the wallet is like a desktop app or sorry, desktop um, web wallet, or, you know, maybe it's a specific website too. It could be stacker news or some other website that has the quote unquote wallet. Um, but the keys always live on my phone or maybe it lives on like a little, I think the Stackworks people made this like little e EPS device. Uh, it was like some $5 device where the keys lived. Um, so it starts to like extract the keys from the wallet so that the wallet could live anywhere. It could be insecure for all, for all matters. It's just the keys are secure. The, uh, the challenging part with VLS is that to do lightning properly um, in this sort of like air gapped model, you, you have to be well aware of what you're signing. Um, you can't blind sign with lightning properly. There's like a handful of different keys that are involved. Um, there's a handful of different like things that need to be signed, whether they're like commitment transactions or revocation transactions, you pretty much have to be aware. And then like, okay, what if, what if, um, what if a channel got forced closed and it's already on the chain? Like you need to be aware of that. So VLS almost turns into a full node with the keys on it, just in and of itself. That, that to me is the challenging part of VLS that, you know, I think they, 
they have to solve and, and they have to make it easy to solve. Otherwise, the trade-off is you could try to blind sign. I mean, L&D has support for like remote blind signing, um, but it's like it, it doesn't really protect as much as you would think it protects. Um, you, you could send a malicious, not a malicious signature, but you could, if you had access to the thing you're trying to protect your keys from, and it sends over a message saying, hey, give me all your funds. It goes, oh, okay. <laughs> and it just signs, signs it right back. But what are you protecting if you're, not, if you're trying to protect the, C, the, the keys? So, um, yeah, I think there's some challenging parts of VLS to sign, but it's essentially almost, it's almost a complete lightning node that lives somewhere else with the keys on it. And meanwhile, your applications interact with it um, without exposing your keys. And it does all its validation. You can set up policies like, hey, only send 10K SATs a day. Or, oh, if there's any rev revokement, uh, you know, revoking transactions, like go ahead and broadcast them. You know, there's, there's a lot of policies at play there. But, um, yeah, I think they're doing a really good job of, of trying, to, trying to make it so you can do it. If anything, it's great for enterprises to be able to have the keys that live you know, somewhere where, you know, a few trusted parties go. But meanwhile, the, the node operators could run the node and the VLS, like it could be the CFO of a company or something that like validates, oh, okay, yeah, do all these things that the node operator said to do. Right. Do you think that this VLS project will help to make people more comfortable using Lightning? Because I know that the fact that these are hot wallets has kind of been like a concern for a lot of people in the past. It's It's still kind of like, I don't know how much of a concern it is. Like, I don't know how we can't live in two realities at the same time. So it's hard to know, like, you know, if there were higher security assurances, would we see double the capacity on lightning five times the usage? Like, I don't know what the actual difference is, but do you think that on balance, this shifts that, you know, security trade-off and the security risks in, in people's eyes and it compels them to put more funds on lightning and use it more? It might. Um, <clears throat> depends on the type of user it is. And so like, you know, it, it'd be different. Like maybe it makes, um, you know, enterprise companies a lot more uh, favorable to something that has this like, you know, a better security model for the keys. It might make them more comfortable to do in it. Or it might mean, uh, it might mean there's um, something like fire blocks for lightning. Um, so like, you know, enterprise customers can go to, some third party that that manages the nodes in a secure VLS like way, uh, and maybe one of the keys will live on the on site, but most of the keys live in you know some secure enclave that some third party is doing. I think you I think there's like an argument to be made that it could be better for it might make uh, enterprise customers more you know feel more secure for it. Um, for users though, um, it's got to be easy. It's it, like that's like there's for most people, it will come down to whether they feel comfortable operating the thing that they're that they have in front of them. Um, so, you know, I know it was really early, so I'm not like saying too much about it, but I thought it was really cool. The the demo that Stackworks people did at a TabConf last year where everyone got one of these little devices and they set up their own VLS project with a node that, you know, that ran in the server, but the VLS was right there. Um, in their hands. Um, that was so cool, but it was like the most challenging thing I've ever done in the, in a one hour period. Um, so if it, if it's really easy for users and it's just like a little screen and they sometimes click yes or no on it, then I can, I can see it making people a little bit more comfortable, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, it depends on how much someone is wanting to put on there. Like, I mean, like you said earlier, like, you know, most, most people are okay with, the amount of money they they're leaving on custodians um, for at least for lightning. So I don't know if we'll see more adoption from general users, you know, have having more like spending wallet stuff. If, if, if it's something like VLS, but at least in a browser context, it would, I, it would make me more comfortable if we had something like VLS that didn't have the keys that lived uh, in the browser storage. Fair enough. All right. I want to finish off with, uh, a rapid fire round I do at the end of every show. It's called the lightning round. Are you ready? Yeah, let's do it. All right. If you can only hold one asset for the next decade and it cannot be Bitcoin, what asset is it? It's gotta be bullets. Bullets, okay. <laughs> if you could change one thing about the lightning network, just snap your fingers and make a change, what would you change? Uh, offline payments. We need that today. 
We're, we're going to get it soon, but it's not, I, I want it today. <laughs> Is there any book that has meaningfully changed your view of the world? Definitely the Bible. Even from a mm-hmm. historical context, there's a lot of, of good juicy stuff in there. Interesting. And then finally, uh, who's one Bitcoin builder, Bitcoin or Lightning builder that you'd like to give a shout out to for doing great work? Uh, Matt Corrala, for sure, from the LDK team. He, from both a management perspective of, of, of you know, being a you know, lead engineer on it to, um, to being intelligent on Lightning. He, he's, he's an all around good guy. So props to him. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat today. I learned a lot. Uh, where can listeners go to learn more about you and Mutiny? Yeah, um, Mutiny is just mutinywallet.com. Um, we have a Twitter as well. All of our links and stuff are on the page. I don't, I don't know what my end pub is. So I can't read that off air, but um, all of our profile links are there. So you can find us on mutinywallet.com. Awesome. Thanks again for the time. Hope we can do it again soon. Thank you. In the last 30 days, you guys sent in 32,551 sats. And that came in from 39 different supporters. Big shout out to everyone who's been contributing. Let's read through some of the top comments in the last few days. We have uh, Michael Matulev sent in a heart emoji on episode 114. That is with Matt Black on building atomic finance. And we had D Crystal J sent 100 sats and said, too bad he didn't want to do the lightning round. I like that he is supporting space chains and side chains. This is in reference to Super Testnet not wanting to do the lightning round on episode 113. Uh, that's another great episode if you have not listened to that one yet. And then Blockchain Boog sent in 5,000 sats and said Atomic Finance all day, every day. Again, on episode 114, that's the most recent one with Matt Black building Atomic Finance. Can't wait to see what you guys send in this week. I'll have another episode up for you shortly.